There was a time my parents went on a trip to Europe. I was taking care of their house. I was home for the summer from school anyway, so it was fine. I had been there for a few weeks and it was pretty quiet. I just went to work, came home, had some time with my friend, enjoying the house to ourselves and whatnot. But one night, I was just laying there watching TV when I heard this really weird low whistling sound coming from the window that was behind the couch. It struck me as sort of odd and I just shrugged it off. But then it happened again. It totally sounded like it was a person standing up against the window whistling. I looked out the window and obviously there was no one there. So I figured I should go check it out. If it was something like the wind on a siding, I should probably fix it because that would get annoying. So I walked out into the backyard. The backyard in my parents' house is really, really pretty. It's sparse, but sort of forest that leads to a road on the other side. So I looked at the house and didn't see anything. But then I heard the sound again. It was coming from the woods in the back. I was pretty creeped out at this point. And of course, I couldn't see anything in the woods. So I hurried back through the door and I locked it behind me. I never really heard that sound again for the next few days. Until one night, I was asleep in my room and I could have sworn I was awakened by the whistling sound against my second floor window. I listened hard and it was dead silent. So I decided I should go ahead and look out the window. I did that whole thing where I crept super slowly towards it and just sort of peeked through it. Outside my window, there was a man just standing there. I was really sleepy, so I can't know how much of this I'm misremembering. But he was just sitting there staring at me. I was completely frozen and slowly the man pursed his lips and I could hear that whistle again. It was crystal clear. It made me feel like crying. I tore myself away from the window and I hid under my covers. The next night I insisted that my friend stay with me. He did. And of course nothing happened. He figured that I was just tired and delirious and maybe I was right. It gets kind of anticlimactic here, but I didn't hear it for another week or so. And when I did, it was just one small whistle just happening randomly, coming from a wall or something like that. It just happens every week or so, and it always freaks me out tremendously. To this day, I would never stay in that house alone anymore. My name is Chris, and this happened to me in the late 1970s. I grew up in a poor neighborhood in Calgary, Alberta, and like most young kids, I had a number of friends from school and the neighborhood. I was 13 at the time, and this was right at the very beginning of the personal home computer revolution. You would hear about personal computers on the news all the time. However, no one actually owned a home computer, and it was almost like a story of science fiction to actually see one. One day. My friends started talking about this university professor who moved into one of our duplexes near our school. He was supposed to be a really cool guy who had all kinds of gadgets in his apartments and he actually owned a personal computer. One afternoon, when walking home from school, I was crossing through a park near the professor's house. From the second floor balcony of the duplex, I saw some of my friends and they waved to me to come over so I did. The teacher lived on the second floor of a two-story duplex and looked the part of a teacher with shaggy hair, beard, and glasses. At the time, I was too young and naive to see the warning signs about this guy. He lived alone in a three-bedroom duplex apartment. He said he had a girlfriend, but we never actually saw any woman ever at the apartment when me and my friends were there. He had a lot of weird-looking camera equipment and developed his own film. Most importantly, he was a computer science teacher when the field was pretty brand new and he had built a home computer from scratch. My friends and I thought he was the coolest guy we ever met. He had all kinds of games on his computer and he allowed any of the young guys in the neighborhood to pop by and play on his computer. He also had all kinds of weird gadgets and experiments. 
He had one of those Jacob Ladder lightning arc gadgets you'd see in those old horror movies. He always seemed to have some new gadget he was making. It wasn't long before we were going over this teacher's house to play on the computers or see his weird gadgets all the time. Sometimes he'd get very physical and grab one of us from behind and bear hug us when he was greeting us. Or he'd stand uncomfortably close to us. After a few months, we were getting suspicious about this guy. He didn't seem to have any family or friends. Sometimes, when there were a lot of kids at his apartment and he was distracted, we would snoop around and look in his cabinets and things like that. we find weird items like a pair of brass knuckles, handcuffs, and some beads that looked like they were supposed to be white, but they had dried up brown stuff on them. And the door to his bedroom was always locked. One day, when there was a lot of kids there, he put on some music. He always puts on music, but this time it wasn't top 40 music like he usually would put on. It was like folk music of some kind. My buddy and I were already suspicious at this point. And while everyone was having fun on the computer or hanging with the teacher, we listened to the lyrics of the music. It was hard to make out the lyrics over all the raised voices in the room, but it became very clear that the lyrics was about homosexuality. My buddy and I freaked out as it hit us at the same time that this guy might like kids in a way that wasn't right. We quickly made an excuse to leave and went home and told our parents of our suspicions. My father freaked out and told us never to go over that guy's place again. We also put the word out on the street and pretty quickly everyone became weary of this guy. However, one of my friends from our block, Danny, he thought we were all wrong and he kept going to see this teacher. One day, Danny stopped coming to school, and the rumor was that something bad happened to him by that guy with the computers. Danny moved away, and not long after, so did the teacher. I can't tell you how lucky me and my buddies felt to have stopped going to that guy's house before something happened to us. Years later, when I was in my early 20s, I took a course at the university on computer programming. One night, my buddy and I were in a computer lab and we were testing out a new program I wrote. When who walks into the lab? That old guy. This time, both my buddy and I stood up and yelled at that guy to get away from us. He quickly left, and other people in the lab asked what was going on. We told them what happened years ago. I don't know if someone reported him, but we never saw him at the university again after that. My name is Stan. I'm 17 years old. And this story happened about four years ago. The school I went to was in a very rural area in my village. My friend Peter went to the same school, but I lived further away. His mom would always drop him off near my house and we would always walk to school together. On our way to school, we would always pass some farms. And one of them had this really old creepy house that was abandoned for years. One day me and Peter said we should check it out and see what's in there basically. We couldn't go after school because, like I said, Peter lived further away and his mom needed to get him home. This was also during the winter, so it got dark sooner. So myself and Peter, we came up with the plan that Peter would have a sleepover around my house. And when my parents were asleep, we would sneak out and explore the abandoned farmhouse. It was Friday and the past few days had been snowing. After school, Peter came to my house we spent the evening playing video games and looking up creepy videos on the internet, anxiously waiting to sneak out. 1 a.m. rolled around and we put our coats on and snuck out my bedroom window, which is ground level. We had one flashlight between the both of us, which Peter managed to sneak out of his dad's garage. We walked through the farm fields and made it to the house. Naturally, the first thing we did was try to open the front door, but it was locked. We looked around at a few of the windows and one of them was smashed open. So we used this as our entrance. Surprisingly, the place seemed rather untouched for how long it had been rumored to be abandoned. It was just covered in dust and had a really strong smell. Not bad necessarily, but it did smell odd. I shone my flashlight to the top of the stairs. I couldn't see anything, but it seemed really eerie up there and then I heard wood creaking. 
It kind of sounded like slow footsteps, but I wasn't certain. Peter then said, we should check upstairs. I told him I'm not going, there's probably some maniac up there waiting to kill us. The next thing that happened was the phone rang. One of those really old phones made myself and Peter jump out of our skin. At that time, I didn't think about it, but I thought it was weird of how someone was calling this house and it was abandoned. I picked it up and I said in a nervous voice, uh, hello? For a second there, there wasn't any response. And then a man spoke on the other end saying, I'm not a maniac. Why don't you come upstairs and see for yourself? At that point, loud, heavy footsteps ran across the upstairs room and toward the top of the stairs. Peter and I ran out the farmhouse as fast as we could. We ran out down to the farm. I glanced back to see if there was someone chasing us, but there wasn't. So I told Peter to slow down so we could catch our breath for a second. After taking a better look at the house, one of the upstairs lights was on and there was a dark figure standing at the window watching us. I didn't know what to think and honestly I was terrified. The light then turned out and the both of us made our way back to my house. We managed to sneak back inside without making my parents wake up. Peter didn't say much. I think he was too creeped out as to what just happened. And to be honest, I didn't feel like talking either. I was actually quite paranoid that, I don't know, that guy was gonna follow us to my house. Thankfully, at least to what I know of, we weren't followed. From that night on, every time me and Peter walk to school, we look at that creepy farmhouse. We can't help but feel someone's looking back at us. For a little backstory, I'm trans. I try to present as male as best as I can, but it's still pretty obvious that I'm biologically female. I have short hair and I wear guy clothes, but I have a very unmistakably female face. I also live in a very religious area, so it's not a very common or accepted thing. One of our neighbors is a priest, but he's very accepting and his house is a bit like a second home for me because I think of him like one of my grandparents and he sees me as a grandson. Anyway, I was walking home from school during the winter a few years ago and it had started snowing. Needless to say, it was pretty damn cold and I was miserable. The wind felt like it ignored my clothes and chilled me right to the bone. It was hard to hurry because the freezing wind made my muscles really stiff. I was only maybe a quarter of the way home when a car slowed down and pulled up next to me. It was just a little old lady. She looked nice enough and at this point I was willing to do anything to get out of walking another three miles in the cold, so I got in when she offered to give me a ride. It felt a hell of a lot better in that car than it did to walk. She was very nice at first. She prattled on about how her grandchildren went to the same school as me talked about how lucky we were to live in such a nice Christian community and so on. When she started on about being a good Christian, about how much she loved Jesus, I was a bit uncomfortable, but I didn't say anything. After all, even though I'm not a Christian myself, it isn't my place to say anything about religion. Believe what you believe and all that. She'd just been nice enough to give me a ride, so I didn't want to offend her. When she started talking about Leviticus, that's when I knew I had messed up by getting into her car. She started going on and on about gay people and how they're just confused, how man should not lay with man, and so on. We were getting close to where I was going to have her drop me off. When I mentioned that she could drop me off there, she looked over at me and didn't say anything. She didn't slow down either. I was starting to get nervous. We passed the point I'd told her about. I looked over at her and said something along the lines of, You can let me out here. She gripped the steering wheel really hard and said, I can't let you out. You need me. I asked her what the hell she was talking about and she turned to me. Your short hair. I knew I needed to help you when I saw it. You're a sick girl. You need to let go of the demon inside you. I tried to cast aside the discomfort of being called a girl and stumbled out something about just liking short hair, having a boyfriend, anything that would make me seem a little bit more innocent in her eyes. But it didn't look like she believed me. I wanted to cry as I watched the drop-off point get further and further away. 
I begged her to let me out, promised that I would go to church, repent my sins, as long as she let me out and let me go home to my family. She screamed at me that she hated dykes and that she was going to call her son to help her, quote, fix me. At that point, I knew I needed to get out. I grabbed the handle and unlocked the door, only to feel my hopes sink as the electric lock kicked in and relocked it. She was still screeching about how I just needed to be with a man and it would fix me. That accepting God's truth would fix me. It might sound ridiculous to be afraid of an old Christian lady, but I was terrified. I was so scared of what would happen if I didn't get out. I took my chance and rolled down the window as fast as I could and made a jump for it. I landed on a pile of rocks and my breath was knocked out of me. I could hardly move. Everything in my body hurt horribly, but I knew I needed to get out of Dodge before she decided to come back. I got up and limped into my neighborhood. As soon as I came to that old priest's house, I snapped out of the stupor I was in and was hysterical. I banged wildly on the door until he let me in, and I cried uncontrollably while he called the police. I was taken to the hospital after I told the police what had happened. The jump from that car broke my femur in four places and cracked both my knees. It amazed doctors that I was able to make it to the priest's house in the condition that I was in. I've never seen that lady again, or her car, but since then I never walked to or from school alone anymore. I can only hope nobody ever got into her car again. The story literally happened to me a week ago. My name is Joseph and I live in a country based in Europe. I am a student studying at university and currently live with my parents. A few days ago before this outbreak took place in my country, we had been informed through the media that we shouldn't leave our houses and to minimize contact with people for the next two weeks. The government had closed down all schools and certain businesses. This also included events within my own country. It was a Friday evening. I was trying to kill some time by playing computer games when me and my parents heard our doorbell ring. I was confused because we weren't expecting anyone. It would be really irresponsible to visit during the outbreak. I thought to myself that it could be one of my aunts or my cousins who needed help or supplies, so I immediately went to answer the front door. I was just surprised that they didn't inform us about this visit earlier. Before I could even touch the door handle, I looked through the blinds to see who it was. It wasn't any of our relatives, but two men in dirty yellow overalls which looked like hazmat suits. I couldn't even make out their faces. They looked so creepy. My heart started to beat faster. I thought that my father or mother had her symptoms, and they called the hospital for doctors or some medical professional. Maybe they didn't tell me so as to not make me so worried or panic about them. But when I checked the living room, neither of them seemed to be ill. They were surprised too. Something doesn't feel right. The doorbell rang once again. I hesitated but I finally pulled the door open. The men introduced themselves as a disinfection team sent by the city council. They told us that every house in the area would be disinfected and we will need to leave for an hour. They even showed us papers that seemed legit. We had many doubts but they convinced us. Looking back, it, it was the dumbest thing we did, but they inspired trust in us, and we were already distracted by the stress of the situation. Me and my parents looked at each other. We shrugged our shoulders and decided to take a walk. They gave us a copy of a warrant, plus we thought we were leaving our house in safe hands. After a few minutes of walking, I remember that I forgot to turn off the oven. I said it to my parents about this and they decided to wait for me. I sprinted back to my house. As I got to the house, I heard some weird noises behind the closed door. Why did they close the door? I said to myself. Fortunately, I had an extra key and I opened the door. The view inside the house horrified me. I saw a huge mess. All of the cabinets were left open, furniture was turned over on the floor, and all of the food we gathered as supplies were thrown out. I froze from fear. Millions of thoughts were flying through my head at that moment. I immediately knew we had become victims of a robbery. How could we have been so stupid? I thought to myself. 
I turned around and wanted to run out of the house and call the cops, but I stumbled upon one of the robbers standing at the front door holding a big knife. I can't let you leave, boy. You've seen too much, he said to me in a really evil way. Then he started to run towards me. Without hesitation, I ran to the bathroom and locked the door behind me. He was screaming and pounding on the door. If you open the door, I won't hurt you. I promise, he said. Of course, I didn't believe him and hid inside the bathtub. He started to stab the wooden door. I was so scared I couldn't even blink. My heart was pounding so hard. It felt as if I was trying to escape my chest. I started to pray because I thought that was literally the last moments of my life. Tears started to stream down my face. I cried more than I had ever cried in my entire life. Finally, the pounding on the door stopped. He was gone. I heard police sirens and I opened the door. My parents ran up to me and hugged me. I felt like the luckiest person alive. I was so happy. They told me that after a while of waiting, they eventually decided to walk back to the house. Then my father saw a robber in the door with a knife. He hid behind the trees and called the police. The police told us that they were searching for these men for two weeks. They had already robbed 10 houses in the nearby cities and used the situation as a way to gain trust in people and to access their properties. The papers they found on them were also fake. I hope they will rot in prison now. Let this be a warning. I hope you guys won't fall for this kind of scam. I have never been a huge believer in the supernatural, but I'm not closed-minded either. It's just I have never had an experience of my own. That is, until one night in early December of 2016. I was 16 at the time and was doing what I love best. That is, hunting with my father and grandfather. I have been an avid hunter since my dad brought me my first hunting license when I was just a mere age of seven. Throughout my life I have hunted all kinds of game, from pheasants and turkeys, bears and foxes, to deer and elk. So it's safe to say, I am very familiar with the wildlife all over the United States. This particular encounter took place on my grandparents' property in southern Maine. They own 55 acres of land with a small river that runs through the southwest corner of the property. However, that time of year, that river is nothing but a mud pit. For a little more detail, the topography of the land is very hilly with steep inclines and deep valleys. The plan for the evening hunt was supposed to be a short one and was only supposed to take two to three hours. My dad and grandpa were supposed to come from opposite sides of the valley and I would come down the hill and we would all meet at the halfway point in the valley and walk out together. The valley was very easy to find and it was an old logging road and was well marked. The idea was to push deer to each other. We had a late start so there were only two and a half hours or so of daylight left by the time I started my solo trek down into the valley. Before I started my hunt, I pulled out my phone and looked at the map of the property. I know, I should be able to walk down the hill without navigation. But I have a huge fear that I'll take a wrong turn and get horribly lost. What scares me most is pissing off my grandfather for making him wait for me at the rendezvous point. So to be safe, I looked at the map. The first part of the hunt started off without a hitch. It was making good time while stopping every once in a while trying to look for a deer sign. So far, there was nothing worth mentioning, but I was happy to be in the woods regardless. Things, however, became really bad really quickly. As I mentioned, there wasn't much daylight left to begin with, so we took that into account. What we didn't take into account was that the storm came in like a bat out of hell with no warning. In an instant, the sky became dark as night, and the snow came down to the point where seeing more than five feet in front of you was damn near impossible. I had enough and began to haul my butt to the meeting point at the bottom of the hill. Once I finally reached the level ground, a wave of relief finally fell over me. I was cold, wet, and wanted a hot shower. Then my heart sank. I was not at the old logging road. In fact, I had no idea where I was. Crap. Everything I know about making out of situations like this tells me to stay calm. Forget about that, I am everything but calm. 
I knew I was down the hill, so I had the hope that my grandfather and dad were somewhere close by. Not even thinking about scaring any deer, I yell out, Dad! Grandpa! I took a momentary pause to listen for a response. All that I heard was the wind blowing through the valley and the sound of snowfall. Then I heard something I truly cannot explain. I heard, Dad! Grandpa! Echoed back to me. What the heck? Over here! I yelled back, only to have, Over here! Yelled back to me. This time it was really close. Whatever was echoing me was moving fast. To heck with this. I pulled out my phone to try to call my dad or at least figure out where I am, but of course it was dead. The only thing I was sure of was the fact that I did not want to be in these woods any longer. I figured that if I walk in one direction long enough, I would eventually end up at a house or a road. I must have been walking for close to a half hour with no sign of, well, anything but more woods. The whole way I had an uneasy feeling. It was like something was there but it wasn't like it was watching me. It felt like it was stalking me. Every time I paused to get my bearings, I could hear the sound of the snow crunching under my footsteps. When I had enough, I called out, Who's there? Nothing but the sounds of steps circling me. Then I remember them stopping. I was able to pinpoint where the steps stopped. It was dead ahead of me. I looked out into the woods, and behind a large hemlock, I noticed something ducked behind a tree. It was quick, so I couldn't make out any details, but whatever it was, it was tall and skinny, and it was thin enough to hide behind a tree without being seen. By this point, I wasn't sure what my next move would be. I was too afraid to move forward to the hemlock. I had no interest in finding out whatever this creature was. I raised my rifle and pulled back the firing pin. I put a round into the tree, and almost instantly I heard the thing take off at warp speed. Thinking I got rid of this thing, I continued walking in the same direction. I thought if I could just get to a road, my dad and grandpa would be looking for me. So I carried on and so did the storm. After another hour or so, with no other issues, I finally stumbled onto a paved street. Now I had to figure out how to contact my dad, so they could come pick me up. That is when I heard it again. Dad! Grandpa! Over here! The thing had still been stalking me. I fired off another round into the air, but it had no effect. The creature just kept yelling back to me, and it was getting closer. Once it sounded like it was almost on top of me, it went dead silent. I looked around and heard a welcome sound. It was my dad's truck coming down the road. Thank God. I piled in and began to tell my dad and grandpa everything. When my dad started to drive off, I looked behind me and through the red glow of the tail light I saw a tall figure duck behind another tree. I, to this day, never figured out what was stalking me in those woods. If anyone has any ideas as to what I encountered, I'm all ears. For this story, my name will be Charlie. Years ago in my first year of college, I lived in a dorm. But if only I knew what was going to happen. I earned a scholarship to college for baseball and all the players lived in one dorm. Being that I was a freshman, they roomed me with a senior so he could show me what right looks like. He was a pretty tough guy who no one would mess with, so I felt like I was in good hands. It was the winter and by that time of the school year, I was pretty set in my ways and comfortable. I was invited to a house party that one of the sororities were throwing, so I went with a few friends. When we got there, it was like any other party. People were outside and some were inside having fun. While inside, there was music playing along with people playing video games in one room, and it looked like a board game going on in the other. That was upstairs. After a while, I went upstairs to see why anyone would be playing a board game at a party. When I got to the room, I noticed that it was the most quiet room in the house, which was odd to me. When I walked in the room, there were four girls and a guy sitting at a table. I asked what was going on, and they said they were using the Ouija board. I thought it sounded interesting, so I joined. But I never really believed in that type of stuff. While we were messing with the board, they said that there was a girl in the room. 
but I think that one of the other people that were playing moved it, so I left. That's when unexplainable stuff would happen to me in my dorm. I'd hear laughing in our hallways at odd times of the night, knocks on the window, and I started to have bad dreams. I told my roommate, but he told me it was stress from our upcoming midterms. That went on for about two weeks. Then one night, everything changed for both of us. I remember it being a Thursday night when this happened. I was asleep in the middle of the night, and all I heard was, Charlie, 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 wake up. I remember making noises and being half asleep, but I acknowledged them. Then he said something that woke me up immediately. Charlie, what the fuck is that in the corner? I looked in the corner of the room and I swear there was a silhouette of a girl. I was so afraid that I jumped off the top bunk and I told my roommate to get up and run, but he was so petrified. He was under his covers quivering. Then she spoke. Why do you seem so scared? All I wanted to do was play with you. I told him I'm out and we both ran out of our room. He was yelling as she's talking. After that, we were both so shaken that we never went back to that room. We called the police, but when they came, they never found any girl. I don't know if it was because of the house party, Ouija board game, or coincidence, but that was a moment that I'll never forget. Till this day, I still hear odd noises throughout the night wherever I go. So, I've been watching a YouTube series about deep web exploration. I won't name this series or the channel it belongs to, I mean, I'm not getting paid for advertisements. Anyway, I looked up a video on how to access said deep web. I did it fast and dirty, not much research on what not to do. Big mistake. Let me tell you right now, using Windows on the deep web is a bad idea, that much I did know. Easy to get hacked that way, since it's the most prominent OS. I know you can boot up a live USB on a Linux clone OS. I mean, a simple Google search can tell you how to do that. It's not as difficult as it sounds. But I figured if my laptop gets hacked, I'm screwed. I can't exactly afford to just buy a new one right now. So I thought I'd be smart and use my Android tablet. What a genius, right? Yeah, I know. I'm an idiot. So, a few VPN apps later and I'm surfing the deep web looking around like a little kid in an adult store. I have no clue what any of it means, but I'm interested in it all. I'm aware you can find a lot of snuff in pedo rings, so I treaded carefully. Unfortunately, I stumbled upon one of the two. I'm not going to say which, but it made me sick to my stomach and I nearly quit then and there. In fact, I did, for a few minutes. I chalked it up to bad luck and resolved to be more careful. I'm not into that shit, not by a long shot. I'm not some deviant with fetishes for snuff or kids. Jeez, man. That image will probably be burned into my brain for the rest of my miserable life. Anyway, I'm browsing for a few hours and it's after 3am. I've heard it's better to use the deep web at night. Less traffic that way. I found a few interesting sites. There's tons of religious stuff on there. You'd be surprised how often you find Satanists. Or, at least people who claim to be Satanists. Most of the time, it's likely to be some edgy teenagers rebelling against their religious families. I won't get into my religious views, don't worry. It even has several of its own social networks and email services. No, thank you. You're begging to be stalked by some creep if you use one of those. Or better yet, get scammed by a catfish or honeypot. There are loads of conspiracy blogs as well. Both interesting and hilarious. Everything from Justin Bieber is secretly a reptilian member of the Illuminati to leaked files on human experimentation. There was even a guy who claimed to have stumbled across interdimensional travel via falling into an actual rabbit hole. As in, a literal physical hole in the ground made by a rabbit. I'd say you can't make this stuff up, but clearly you can. I was serious about the human experimentation, by the way. 
you're going to want to avoid that kind of stuff. If you had any faith in humanity, you'd lose it in a heartbeat. My god, I, I mean, I hope that stuff wasn't legit. Gun shops, drug shops, celebrity nudes, pirated movies, hackers for hire, hitmen, virus programmers, script kitties, stolen credit cards, you name it. There was one site that sold stolen US currency that was supposed to be marked for shredding due to age or poor condition. Seems like they got a lot of business too. No wonder the economy is in the toilet. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of legitimate stuff on there too. I visited the site of a really smart dude who was creating his own custom operating system, even had games and stuff on it. There was funny things too. A mock cult made for people named Dan was among my favorites. The people that weren't maniacs seemed to be open-minded, if a little paranoid. Then I came across a site that supposedly gives you access to the webcams of people's personal laptops. I was curious. I shouldn't have been, I know. I'm not expecting to see some cam girls here. Just some slack-jawed people staring blankly at their screens while watching Let's Plays or some shit. And that's exactly what I saw. Neckbeards, teenagers, old men looking confused, the works. Here's me laughing at unsuspecting people. Then I, I saw myself. Ha ha, very funny, I thought sarcastically. It's tapping into my camera and trying to give me a good scare. It almost did, at first. Even so, I logged off. I kinda realized how bad what I was doing was. Not to mention how illegal it was. I went back to the clear web and watched some Netflix. Soon enough, I had all but forgotten about my deep web exploits. Then my Skype starts ringing. Another Skype number is calling me. I think maybe it's one of my friends trying it out. After all, I have been pestering one of them for a while to get on Skype so we can chat while playing games on Steam. So I pick it up. At first there was silence. Then I heard a voice. A man's voice. He sounded like he was an older guy, 50 plus. Looking good, he said. Without a second's hesitation, I hung up, deleted every deep web related app on my tablet, shut down and restarted my router. I have no fucking clue how that guy got my Skype number. And to be quite honest, I don't want to know. All I know is, if you're going to use the deep web, I beg of you, for your own safety, do more research than I did. Talk to someone who has experience in setting up a proper VPN or some other kind of anonymity. You're sure as hell not going to find it on fucking Google Play. If you went to school any time from the 90s onwards, the chances are that you've at least experienced a lockdown drill. Maybe even an actual lockdown. Obviously, not all of them end in tragedy. Some schools go into lockdown because of a crime committed nearby, or because some parent forgot to wear their visitor's badge. There's lots of different reasons. Most of them have nothing to do with an actual legitimate threat to students. But better safe than sorry, right? I went to school in a post-Columbine world. Lockdowns were always taken very seriously, despite the fact that we lived in a fairly isolated area where most people knew each other. There were regular petitions to allow teachers to carry guns in school. Who knew how long it might take the police to arrive if something were to ever happen? But obviously, I'm not here to debate gun control, so I'll get to the point. Most lockdowns are drills, but I'm going to tell you about one that wasn't. I've always been a pretty nervous and paranoid person. For example, throughout middle and high school, I despised being in the cafeteria because I always seemed to get stuck sitting in some corner nowhere near an exit. It made me anxious, realizing just how much distance I would have to cross just to get out, even if something as innocent as a food fight were to occur. In upstairs classrooms, I would occasionally glance out the windows and ponder where or not the drop might kill me, or if I can make it out with just a broken arm or leg. In downstairs rooms, I would tend to sit near the windows unless I was forced to sit somewhere else. Admittedly, this was also because I just like to look outside and daydream. But like most routines, after enough repetition, you get used to almost anything. If you work in a school, you probably know this like the back of your hand. In the event of a lockdown, teachers are supposed to lock the doors, turn out the lights, and herd students into a part of the room that can't be seen from the window panel on the door. 
This always seemed a bit ridiculous to me. I once had an English class in a room where the only spot that you couldn't see people from the door was, ironically, right next to the door. The idea of us just lining up there while someone jiggled the knob outside sounded horrifying. However, I did have one major concern. What would happen if I were caught in one of these drills outside the classroom? Was I supposed to run and bang on the nearest door, hide in a closet, run outside? I always figured if it came down to it, if I was near an exit and it seemed like the real deal, I would take my chances running outside. Teachers never really told us during drills whether or not they were real, but someone always knew. There was always that one kid whose mom worked at the school and would tell everyone else that they weren't real and that there would be a fire drill the next day or something. They have a special code for when it's real. A girl named Kelly once informed our entire algebra class, if they say lockdown three times, it's only a drill. Four times, it's for real. We all snickered, but what she said lingered in the back of my mind every time the principal went on the loudspeaker, voice crackling throughout the building, and I always counted, awaiting for that fourth time. 11th grade swung around. Now officially an upperclassman, I let a certain confidence seep into my step. I was 16. Next year, I would graduate and would be going to college. I practically owned this dump. I would see everyone that I hated working at McDonald's. You know, the usual 16-year-old spiel. I no longer felt the need to rush into first period. Instead, I lingered in the hallway with other relaxed juniors and seniors and made fun of confused freshmen and actually made eye contact with my teachers. This newfound skip in my step was what led me to cutting the first period bell very close as I wiped out my shirt with a wet paper towel in the bathroom. Someone had tripped on the bus and had gotten what I prayed was iced coffee on me. The stain did not look like it was coming out and I hadn't brought a jacket that day. I groaned, balled up the paper towel and chucked it at the garbage. I missed. Through the thick bathroom walls, I heard the distant crackle of the loudspeaker. Were they starting the morning announcements earlier this year? Maybe someone had parked in a teacher spot again. Lockdown, 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 lockdown. I was more caught off guard by the fact that it sounded like the secretary was making the announcement than anything else. Only after a moment or two did it sink in. This wasn't a drill. I stood there, completely motionless, wondering what the hell I was supposed to do. Finally, I lunged towards the door and yanked it open, peering out into the hall. Every door was shut. I was on the second floor. I thought I heard distant yelling from below. My panic then settled into a cold fear that pulled in the pit of my stomach. I darted back into the bathroom, trying to rationalize things. Maybe I had misheard it and it was just a drill. I tried to remember how the person on the loudspeaker had sounded. Were they frightened? Forced calm? I don't know, and not knowing was the worst part. The police had to be on their way if this was real, I assured myself. So as long as I stayed put, everything would be fine. What potential school shooter was going to check the bathroom? That said, I ran to the last stall, the one for people with wheelchairs, and scrambled up on the toilet. Should I lock the stall door? No, there was no point. If they did come in, it would be obvious that someone was in there. What if somehow they saw me through the small space in the door? Could I somehow wiggle on the ground from one stall to the next in an effort to evade them? By this point, I was slightly hysterical, but I knew, in the back of my mind, like you always know in these situations, if they did come in here, I would probably die. Ridiculously enough, I began preparing my last lines. What would I say? Should I try to plead with them? What if it was someone I knew? Maybe I could talk them down. But I couldn't even convince myself, never mind someone already homicidal. Should I try to be the hero and go for the gun? Right, and get shot in the face. Perhaps I could stall them. Stall. Them. I started to laugh. I didn't know why. Crouched on a grimy public high school toilet seat, my chuckles faded into harsh breathing and I told myself not to look up, no matter what. I heard a loud noise from down the hall and flinched, although I had no idea what it was. I tried to still my breathing and only succeeded in feeling faint, and then I heard it. 
Footsteps. I was sure of it. Maybe it was a cop, I told myself. The footsteps drew closer. I hadn't been raised to be religious, but right then and there, I started to make bargains. I didn't care if I got shot, as long as it didn't kill me or paralyze me. Actually, that might be worse. I just wanted to go home. If whoever was in charge of this shit just made sure I got home, I would do whatever the hell they said for the rest of my life. Maybe they didn't have a gun. Maybe it was a knife. Maybe I could get out of this with a few nasty scars and a story. The bathroom door opened, and I went blank. I'm not sure how to describe it. I felt completely removed. I was there in the stall, but also, I wasn't. Like maybe it didn't really matter much either way, like I was beyond all of it. For a fleeting second, I wondered if I would collapse and die of fright. I knew they were there. I heard them. The first stall door swung open with a groan, as did the second. I tried to close my eyes, but I couldn't. My eyelids refused to cooperate. The third stall door opened. I was convinced I could hear them breathing. I wondered what they were thinking. Were they excited? Could they hear my breathing? God, I thought. Don't let it be someone I know. The next stall opened, and the one after that was mine. Suddenly the loudspeakers crackled on. Lockdown is now complete. Students and staff, thank you for your cooperation. The person in the bathroom paused. They then turned and left, doors swinging quietly behind them. I didn't leave that stall for another five minutes. My first period teacher was very annoyed, but I didn't really care. I informed him about what happened, and he called the vice principal down, and I relayed my story to her. She seemed skeptical about my claim, and told me that the lockdown this morning was only a drill. The staff at the school was questioned, but no one had gone into the bathroom during the lockdown to check for students. I never really heard any more about it, but I am certain that there had been someone in there with me, and they came very close to finding me. My name is Corey, and I've spent a lot, and I mean a lot, of time camping, hiking, and hunting. I've seen all kinds of predators, and I've been in some sticky situations. Everything from a tornado heading my way to being tailed by some bears, so I don't exactly frighten easily. This past July, I was out camping near my family's farm in western Iowa, along with my girlfriend Alexa, my best friend Jason, and his new girlfriend, Samantha. Samantha actually had never been camping before, let alone more than a mile off the trail in the middle of a forest. She was understandably nervous, but we were watching out for her. We do have to watch out for prairie rattlers, poison ivy, and even mountain lions in this part of the state. We made camp in a clearing on top of a small hill with a few trees, but we were deep in the woods to be sure. We arrived to make camp, eat, drink, and went to bed by midnight. Nobody had any injury besides a few mosquito bites. Everything was going according to plan until, suddenly, I woke up to the sound of Samantha screaming at the top of her lungs. I just couldn't believe how loud she was screaming. It, it was actually insane. I woke up, I, I guess at the same time as Alexa, grabbed my light and my Glock and ran out. I told her to stay in our tent just in case. Jason was already trying to comfort Samantha and she was talking, almost babbling about something huge walking through camp and scratching at the tent and making a terrible sound. I told her it could have been a coyote or even a mountain lion. What little food and trash we did have was outside of the camp area so that wasn't an issue. But I assured her that I would stay up and light the fire again that I would take turns with Jason watching the fire because our movement and the fire should scare anything away. This seemed to comfort her and she actually went to sleep in with Alexa. Jason and I both stayed awake talking quietly, watching the fire and checking around camp for tracks and signs. We couldn't see anything obviously wrong or suspicious. It certainly could have been a mountain lion and this did have me on edge with the girls there. About 30 minutes had passed and Jason walked just out of the firelight to take a leak. 
He was off to my left, my tent across the fire in front of me, and Jason's tent behind me. There, off to my empty right, I saw something and heard a large crunch. Jason heard it also and was practically still pulling up his pants running towards the fire. What the hell was that? That is big, he said. I, I know, it could be a big cat. Better get your 44 out of your bag too and get that bright tack light, I told him. He returned with those items and we waited to illuminate whichever area we heard more movement from next. Then we heard a crunch and a snap. More movement almost directly behind us. We stood up simultaneously and spun around, turning the brightest light on. For just a second, we saw what almost looked like a gorilla-sized and shaped figure disappear back into the trees. At this point, I'm trying to keep it together and Jason is just frozen. I tell him to snap out of it and that we need to get the fire to grow. Once the fire is larger, we both need to take a position, one in front and one in the back of the tent to protect the girls. We heard this awful grumbling and growling sound for the rest of the night. I have never heard anything like it. And large crunching and snapping sounds continued to emanate from the woods behind us. Periodically, we would see something move either to our left or right in the clearing just outside the trees. I kept the fire going. I actually had the fire pretty enormous by the end of the night. As soon as the sun started coming up, we packed up. On our way out, we saw large prints in the mud down by a small stream at the base of the hill we were camped on top of. I can't really say anything other than the fact that they basically looked like a huge man's prints. The thing we saw was definitely not a man. I, I, I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was going to hurt us. I, I don't know if it was Bigfoot. Frankly, I don't want to know. The way I see it, it's really not relevant because I was thinking it was a mountain lion initially. Those are also dangerous. I won't let this stop me from camping. Sometimes I guess you just hear scary things at night in the woods. Because scary things do live in the woods. I guess that's just part of the adventure. This happened to me about seven years ago. I worked at KFC through high school and college. I went to college really close to where I grew up, so staying at the same work location was very easy for me. One day I went to work at 4.30 and had to work to drive through half of my shift due to someone calling off. It seemed like a regular day until we were getting ready to close. At around 10.50 p.m., this guy walked in and stood by the front register. He looked weird as if he just came from a costume party. I let him know that when he's ready to order, just tell me as I'm cleaning due to us closing in 10 minutes. He told me that he wasn't ordering and wanted to know what time he closed. I told him 11 p.m. and he left. I noticed that he got inside a van that has been sitting in the parking lot for hours. I thought it was weird but continued to clean up. There were a few of us still on shift. Again, everything seemed regular that night. I grabbed the trash and went outside toward the dumpster. As I approached the dumpster, I noticed someone trying to hide in the shadows behind the dumpster. I stopped immediately, and I tried to squint in order to get a better look. Then whoever that was behind the dumpster moved back so I wouldn't be able to see their shoes anymore. But they didn't know I already saw them. I turned around immediately and went back inside. I told my manager he went to the door with one of my co-workers to get a better look. They couldn't see anyone, so they went outside to check it out and left me inside by myself. I felt safe while they were outside. I went to the cash register at the drive-thru to cash out for the night. Then on my left, I swear I saw the man from earlier in the window. He had a blank look on his face, then he started hitting the window with a dead raccoon trying to get in while yelling my name. I ran to the front door as my manager and co-worker were walking back in. I frantically told them what happened, and my manager ran back outside to the window while my co-worker stayed with me and called the police. The guy left before my manager was able to get him. The cameras outside got the license plate, but it didn't match the description of the van, and the plates were registered to a woman. This guy was never found, and I am forever worried that he will come back for me. 
I've been working at McDonald's now for over five years, and this is still my creepiest experience there. This happened two years ago when I was 18, and I had been working my first overnight shift on front counter. I usually work in the kitchen on overnights, so I had no interactions with any of the customers until then. I was working from 10pm until 6am, which is a usual overnight shift for us. Around 3am I was making some fries when I noticed a man standing there and trying to take pictures with his cell phone of me and my other female coworker, Rebecca. I pointed it out to her and she just rolled her eyes in annoyance and went to take an order and drive through telling me it happened a lot. I was instantly uncomfortable. I wanted to tell the manager but he was in the office doing his manager stuff and I didn't want to bother him. I went over with what I felt was a nervous smile and quickly did my usual greeting. Hello, what can I get for you? He just kind of looked at me and stayed quiet. He was about 5'8", white, early 20s, medium build with dark hair and brown eyes. An average man, I would say, but something about his piercing glare made me feel super uncomfortable. Then he smiled, a smile that sent shivers down my spine. I'll just have a coffee, black, sweetie, he said, and I could instantly smell alcohol on his breath. I nodded and told him the price before he pulled out a $5 bill and went to hand it to me, making sure our hands touched. I avoided his gaze and went to hand back his change when he winked at me and went to go wait for his coffee. I went to go make it as fast as I could, but, just my luck, we were out of coffee on both the front counter and the drive through as we don't sell much through the night. I turned around and kept as little eye contact as I possibly could. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to brew you a fresh pot. Should only take about three minutes. Don't worry, I don't mind. I have quite the view while I wait, he replied, shooting me a wink. I just smiled awkwardly and looked away. I had to make sure I didn't fall behind on my shift, so I began to set up the muffins on the display so we had them all ready for breakfast, which starts at 4am in Canada. So Susan, I heard behind me, realizing it was the guy. I instantly tensed, wondering how he knew my name before I noticed I had my name tag on and quietly cursed to myself. I turned around and looked at him. And he said, What time are you stuck here until tonight, beautiful? I instantly panicked as I didn't do well in these situations. I, uh, seven, I said nervously, which then the guy gave me a huge grin. Oh, so you still have time before you're off, eh? I nodded and noticed the coffee was done pouring. So I went over and made his coffee as he watched me with an intense stare. I handed it to him before saying, have a nice night, earning me another wink. He then waved and said as he turned around, I'll see you later, Susan. I watched as he walked out the door and tried to calm myself down. He doesn't actually know when I'm off, so I'm okay. I thought to myself, 6 a.m. rolled around, and it was finally time to go. I still felt a little paranoid about the guy, but I knew it was now in the past. My coworker Chris was going to drop me off at home as we carpooled, so we got our stuff together and left. As we were heading to his car, I noticed a parked car with someone in it, and of course, it was the guy. I panicked and quickly told Chris, that was the guy, as I had told him what happened not long ago. He instantly brought me into his coat and did his best to keep me hidden as we walked quickly to his car. He made sure no one followed the car, dropped me off, and watched as I went inside telling me to stay safe. I thanked him before going into my house and going to bed. The next day, I went into work and got asked by my manager how I got home. I told them Chris gave me a ride. 
My manager looked confused and said something that made my blood run cold. Oh, that's strange, because some guy was here looking for you just before seven. He said he was here to pick you up. I thought before that the man's intentions weren't good. Just the way he looked at me and spoke to me, like I was prey. And this pretty much confirmed it. Since then, I have refused to work front counter overnight shift, and we no longer wear our name tags overnight. At the time of this story, I was about 12 years old. We lived in Wichita, Kansas. We had just moved there from Garden City, Kansas. My family also lived in a duplex in a rough neighborhood. Less than a block away from the house was my brother's school. And on the weekends and holidays, we would go to his school to play and do kid stuff. Well, one Thanksgiving break, my brother and I went to the basketball courts just to get some shots up. So we had been there for about an hour when I got a strange feeling. Now, I've had this feeling before and I remember knowing it meant something bad. So I looked around for anything that may catch my attention, but there was nothing. So we kept playing, but I could not shake the feeling. So after about 30 minutes, we were preparing to leave, which all we had to do was go across the playground and jump the back fence. And we would just be across the street from our own house. So I go to get the basketball from the court and my brother follows. I get to the ball and decided to shoot a half-court shot. In mid-shot, there's this feeling again. So again, I stop and I look around. That's when I notice a man standing there on the other side of the fence on the sidewalk. He's looking at us, but he's not moving, just standing there. But I really pay him no mind and shoot the shot. Of course, I missed it, but the ball hits the rim and it bounced near the fence. I race over to get it, trying to beat my brother to it. And I reach down to get it, and there's that feeling again. So I look over my shoulder. The guy is still there just watching us. Now he's walking along the fence, running his hand along the fence, just staring at us. Not once did his eyes come off of us. Did not notice. He's heading to the fence entrance. Now I knew that being next to the busy street, people could see us as they passed. But that feeling was so strong, and this guy, he looked so creepy. And he keeps staring at us. Something in me yelled, run. And my feet started moving and my brother was right behind me. We got to the corner of the school and stopped. We turned and looked. And he was entering the fence. And he was still watching, but now he's coming our way. I grabbed my brother and we sprinted around the back side of the school. In the block and a half to our house. We bust open the door and ran to our mother. And we told her what happened with tears coming on our face. She held us and told us everything would be okay and we're safe. She called the police, but nothing ever came of it. I don't know, ever since then, my brother and I were too afraid to go to the park by ourselves. When I was 21, I transferred to a college in San Francisco. I checked out a room for rent on Craigslist. It was in a really nice two bedroom apartment. It was cheap rent and close to campus, so it was the ideal spot. The girl who lived there was 29 and her name was Beth. She was tall and wide, and she had jet black hair and wore pale makeup. She seemed nice, although a little quiet, but she seemed to like me and agreed to let me move in. So far, so good. My first night there, we went out for pizza, and that's when I could tell that something was a little bit off with her. Throughout dinner, she kept telling me how much I looked like Shia LaBeouf, I didn't know what to say, so I just shrugged it off with a, thanks? I mean, I look nothing like Shia LaBeouf, so it just didn't make any sense to me. When we got back home, she asked if I had seen her room yet. I said no, and she took me to see it. Her walls were covered in posters of Shia LaBeouf. She had even printed out photos of him all over her mirror. She owned all of his movies. I, I mean, I didn't know what to make of it. It was creepy. The whole night she had been saying I look like him, and now it's obvious to me that she's obsessed with the guy. A few weeks passed, and I never really saw her that much. We didn't spend any time together, really. She would come home from work and practically run to her room. She would spend the whole night in there. She had this really creepy high-pitched giggle, and I would hear her giggling through the walls at night. 
I wondered what the hell she could possibly be doing. Occasionally, she would come out and talk for like two minutes and then she would always be slurring her words. So I suspected she was drinking a lot. Sometimes she wouldn't say anything and she would just stand in the hallway and watch me in the living room. I would turn and see her and be surprised and say something like, Hello, Beth. And then there would be this long, awkward pause and she would just give out her creepy high-pitched giggle. It was uncomfortable being around her. She gave me the chills. One night, I woke up at around 2 a.m. because I heard what sounded like the front door being unlocked. I came out of my bedroom and all the lights were off, but I could still see Beth standing at the front door. She had her face against it, and she was turning the lock back and forth over and over again, and every time she turned the bolt, she mumbled my name. Max. 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 Seeing her standing in the dark and mumbling my name really freaked me out. And it doesn't help that she kind of looks like a bigger version of the girl from The Ring. I just quietly went back to my room and tried to sleep. One night, I was watching Gladiator and she stumbled out of her room and turned on the living room light, forcing me to pause the movie, which was annoying. She then asked me if I wanted to hear about her ex-boyfriend. It was an uneasy segue into the topic, but I just said sure and then awkwardly sat back to listen to her. Ten minutes into her story and she was extremely riled up. She was screaming at the top of her lungs about their breakup. I was worried that the neighbors were going to call the cops and she wasn't listening to me when I was asking her to lower the volume. Amidst all of her screaming, one thing she said really freaked me out. She was in such a fit and she yelled that she'll slit his fucking throat. That was a big game changer. Suddenly, I had no idea what this girl was capable of. I mean, she was practically a stranger, and everything I had seen was becoming alarmingly disturbing. After a few more minutes, she told me thanks for listening and started doing her giggle. I got out of there pretty fast and went to my room to go to sleep. I had a pretty unsettling feeling about being in the house with her. And what's worse is that there was no lock on my bedroom door. I pushed the edge of my dresser in front of it to act as like a little barricade. I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of my dresser scraping against the floor. Beth was pushing the door open. I turned on my light shouting at her to stop. I could see her through the opening of the door. She was so drunk and had this insane look in her eyes. I pushed the door closed and yelled at her to go to bed. I could hear her walk back to her room but I couldn't fall back asleep. The next morning when I went out into the hallway, my heart dropped. I saw that one of her steak knives was on the floor by my door. I got goosebumps all over my arms. All I could think about was her saying she would slit that guy's throat. I confronted her about it and she said she didn't remember trying to push my door open. She said she didn't even remember telling me about her ex. I had enough. My lease was month to month, so I found a new spot and moved out. About a month after I moved out, she contacted me. I was at the movies and my phone was off. When I got out, I turned my phone on. And to my shock, I received 40 plus text messages that she had sent me over the past two hours. They were all just insane texts that ranged from everything between, Hi, how are you? to, I fucking hate you. It was insane. I didn't respond and I never heard from her again. I always wonder, if I hadn't set my dresser in front of my door, would she have quietly crept into my room and slit my throat? It freaks me out. A couple of years ago, one of my closest friends relocated cross country with his long-term girlfriend to work a job he couldn't refuse. The only issue he had was that he didn't want to fly his dogs out with him when they had made the move since they'd be staying in a hotel for the first month. He was also a bit reticent to fly them out due to health concerns for both pets. By the time he located a home to rent, he was missing his furry babies and made the request of his sister, another close friend, and myself to drive them to him in LA. Now we are Chicago folks so the trip would be a long one, however, with the three of us to foot the near 30 hour drive, it would be a piece of cake. We left early and drove long hours. Along the way, it was decided between my friend and I that we'd foot the majority of the drive ourselves and, if we needed to, 
we'd let our friend's sister do some driving. We were in a bit of a time crunch due to a snafu with the rental agreement, so we didn't have the luxury to stop very often past an eight-hour stay at a Denver La Quinta Inn. As for the journey itself, it was relatively smooth, barring getting pulled over right before entering Utah for driving two miles in the left lane of an empty highway. Whoops. From that point, we made it through Utah, Arizona, and Nevada without much problem until we entered California in need of gas. I had been driving for the majority of the first day and tagged my buddy in after being pulled over. I remained in the shotgun seat as navigator, searching through the GPS for a fuel stop. We kept our eyes peeled for road signs and discovered a sign pointing to Yermo Ghost Town or something along those lines which had a mobile station. How wonderful. It was convenient too as it wasn't located almost directly off of the interstate. We rolled in on a little more than fumes when we approached the pumps. Normally we'd let the dogs out at every rest stop but having stopped not long before then and with both dogs sleeping snugly in the back, I decided to pump gas without anyone else leaving the vehicle. My buddy pulled up on the opposite side of a beat up green sedan with a short, plump gentleman who just turned in to approach the shop. I noticed a few other hoopties at the pumps, all unoccupied and there were a couple of other cars parked up near the station, most likely belonging to the employees so nothing seemed out of the ordinary, until I swiped my credit card. The pump rejected my first swipe attempt which I chalked up to a misread. I swiped again, and the pump read, Please see attendant. I was annoyed, but we needed gas. I tapped on the window and told my buddy what I was going to do, and asked if anyone needed anything. After taking their orders for Gatorade and Marble Reds, I walked up to the store to make a mental note of how strange this gas station was. Kind of quiet, especially for one right off the interstate, but it's no matter. As I walked in, though, more weirdness. First thing I noticed is that there were some boxes of chips just left on the floor, like someone was stocking shelves and just quit. As I veered to my right, I noticed immediately that there was no one milling about in this place. With the six cars besides my own out there, I felt like I would see someone. Things got even weirder when I realized that there was no one behind the counter, no customers or workers. And then it dawned on me, what happened to that gentleman who was at the pump adjacent to mine? Surely they can't all be in the bathroom. This is where I began to feel this gnawing sensation in my stomach. Something isn't right. I have always been a person who felt like I could always trust my instincts, and those instincts were screaming at me to just get the hell out. I want to run, but I hold back. I would look suspicious booking it out of the gas station that was empty and decide to just play it cool. Natural. Don't let your body language let on to how badly you're freaking out in your head. I was probably inside of this gas station for only a couple of minutes when I left, but I stopped just before exiting to listen for something, anything. A flushing toilet would have been a good sound, but nothing. As I exit the shop and see my car, I begin to feel dread. It's like that moment in the movie where the hero is about to make it to the end of their trial, but the celebratory fanfare disappears, and in that silence, Something comes and strikes them down. I'm about 25 yards from the car when I see this gentleman come out from around the side of the shop opposite of me. This is not the same man as I saw while pumping gas. He was larger and had a peculiar look on his face. And the best way I could describe it was like Nick Cage's smile from face off before the titular act had occurred. I continued walking towards my car, but when I turned back to look at him, he was now walking towards me with a purpose. At this point, I got the fuck back to the car with increased urgency in my step. And of course, my friend has the door to the car locked like a complete douche clown. There is also the 95-pound golden retriever sitting in my seat. Apparently, my travel companions did not notice how freaked out I was, or the creepy gentleman still walking in my direction. I punched the window and told him to unlock the fucking door to which she only half rolls down the window to tell me the dog was in my seat and they were afraid she'd jump out when I opened the door. I reached my hand in and threw the dog towards the back seat as hard as I could while my friend is just now realizing how freaked out I am. He started the car and drove off quickly. I took one last look back and see Nick Cage had stopped about a pump away from where we were, still with that same look on his face. 
we found another gas station further down the road, this time with a ton of people inside and out. After thoroughly creeping up my friends with the story as I pumped gas, we made our way back to the interstate, which meant passing that gas station again. It's been about 15 minutes since we pulled out initially, and we go silent as we notice that those very same cars are still sitting in the same spots where we had left them. After thoroughly freaking out for a few miles, I received a phone call from my credit card company about a hundred dollar charge at a mobile station. The lady on the phone was really helpful in fixing the situation for me and was as entirely creeped out by the situation as we were. In the end, we made it to LA and had a great vacation, but it still bothers me as to what the hell was going on at this little gas station off the highway and what the hell was that smiling man's story?